So you're the CEO of a publicly traded company and you want to make more money. And let's say your company is not a sexy company like Tesla or something like that, but more of a boring bland company like waste management, for example. I'm in a waste management business. The trash company with those iconic dark green trash trucks. I'm the trash man. And as the CEO of a company like this, the only way you can make more money is by pumping the company's stock price to the moon. Why? Because when the stock price goes up, investors are happy, the board is happy, which means you get a higher salary, you'll get paid more bonuses. A lot of your money comes from stock options, where you get to buy stock at a set price, which means the higher you pump the stock price, the more money you stand to make. If the stock price keeps growing, the board of directors will want to keep you around instead of firing and replacing you, and a ton of other reasons. That is why executives at public companies are obsessed with getting their stock price as high as possible. It is the air they breathe, it's how they get wealthy. So we have to do everything in our power to get that number up. And there are a few ways to increase your stock price. Number one, you could just build a better, more profitable company. This is by far the best way. But as you can imagine, building a great company, reducing expenses, increasing profits, constantly innovating and sustaining that growth over years and years and years is really, really, really hard. We need to find an easier, faster way. Which brings us to number two. Instead of building a better company, you could just have the narrative of a revolutionary disruptive tech startup set to change the world. When you have the narrative of a Tesla, you can skyrocket your stock price while your company is actually not making any money. But again, you're a trash collecting company. So unless you want to venture into self-driving trash trucks or something, this really isn't an option. So that only leaves us with option three. Instead of actually building a better company that justifies a higher stock price, or instead of building up a bunch of hype as a tech company, you can just make your company look like it's doing insanely well on paper without doing any of the actual hard work. This is also known as cooking the books. Now hear me out here. The board of directors, analysts, and big investors typically judge a public company on only one thing. Profit. 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 Ah yes, the mighty bottom line. That is the only thing anyone ever looks at what's left over after all the money you made and spent. And the great thing about your books is that you can easily cook them. Change a few numbers here, change a few numbers there, and all of a sudden you take a mediocre company and make it look like a revolutionary one that I have to buy shares of right now before it climbs any higher. Just to be clear, cooking the books is fraud, and I don't actually recommend you doing it. But that is exactly what waste management did. See, collecting trash is not a very exciting business. There's not exactly a lot of room for insane growth. And the CEO of Waste Management at the time, Dean Buntruck, was well aware of this. He has spent the last few decades buying up the entire trash industry in America, which made Waste Management look amazing. They were experiencing all this growth and became a darling on Wall Street. Waste Management was a safe bet. Everyone needs their trash taken out, and look how fast they're growing. But it got to the point where there were simply no other competitors to buy out. Dean had reached a glass ceiling, and if he didn't do something, Waste Management would stagnate, and their stock price would come crumbling down. But Dean still wanted more money. He still wanted more bonuses. He needed his stock options to be worth tens of millions of dollars. So he systematically cooked the books for years. And it worked. In early 1992, the stock was at around $17. Just six years later, it was a staggering $55 for a trash company. And as a result, him and his top executives made off with tens of millions of dollars, all thanks to this fraud. And this is a masterclass on how he pulled it off. Stay dangerous and let's get into it. Have you noticed that a lot of sponsor spots on YouTube lately are for email newsletters like Morning Brew? Or how every YouTuber tries to launch their own newsletters? It's because newsletters can make a lot of money. Think about it, Morning Brew has over 4 million subscribers, 4 million eyeballs, and every single email they send out contains sponsor spots. Brands will pay a lot of money to get featured in giant newsletters like these. That's why Morning Brew was able to make over $50 million in revenue in 2021 alone, all from running a short email every day. It is insane. That's why if you're looking to start your own side hustle, you should consider this email newsletter business model. You don't have to be on camera or edit videos. All you have to do is write emails people want to read and the sponsor money will come. And the best platform to create your newsletter is called SendFox. SendFox allows complete beginners to launch your email list without breaking the bank. You can use it to build landing pages and forms to collect emails without needing any design skills. 
And then you can use their easy to use tools to create engaging email campaigns with custom colors, text, images that look just as good as the most successful newsletters out there. And what's really cool is that if you can't think of what to write, you can use their smart campaigns feature, which will pull content from your social accounts like your Twitter, Instagram, or podcast, and then automatically repurpose that existing content into new emails with just one click. So you don't even have to write a thing. Typically, software like this requires a monthly subscription, but thanks to our friends at AppSumo, you can get lifetime access to SendFox for just $49 with the link below. No recurring subscription. And you get a 60-day money-back guarantee. So you can try out launching your newsletter, and if you don't like it, you're not out of any money. So what are you waiting for? Launch your newsletter business right now with SendFox for just $49 with the link below. Thanks to AppSumo for sponsoring this video. So, cooking the books. See, as a trash company, you have to spend a lot of money on equipment, like trash trucks. These trash trucks cost a lot of money. Today they cost around $300,000 each, which cuts into your profits since you have to buy a ton of trash trucks every year. But there's a little trick we can play to make us look more profitable on paper. See. When you buy a piece of equipment like a trash truck, you can transfer your cash into this thing. You can still sell the trash truck and get cash back. So technically, you're not out of $300,000 entirely. You just transferred that $300,000 of value from cash into this thing. And every year as you use this truck, the resale value of it goes down. So instead of showing the entire $300,000 loss this year thanks to this trash truck, the government lets you break this loss up over a few years with something called depreciation. In the case of waste management, they were able to break up the depreciation of their trash trucks over eight years. So to keep this simple, that means if a truck costs you $300,000 every year, you can depreciate around $37,500 of that 300 k for the next eight years. So every year, you spend around $37,500 from the trash truck going down in value. Waste management has over 32,000 trash trucks. So every year, in this example, they're showing a staggering $1.2 billion loss on their books just from this depreciation thing. That is not good. We gotta start cutting the crust off this sh sandwich. If we want the company to look more profitable on paper, we need to do something about this depreciation thing. So in the case of waste management, the goal for them was to bring on new investors. And the way you bring on new investors is by showing how profitable you are as a business. One of the expenses that works against your income on the tax return is depreciation. So if you choose to alter depreciation, whether you choose to increase it or decrease it, that can determine how profitable your business is and can determine whether or not an investor wants to invest inside of your company. Hmm. What if we just arbitrarily changed that eight-year number to something higher? Maybe 10 years? All of a sudden, just from this one simple change, instead of showing a giant $37,500 expense every year, we would only have to show a $30,000 expense every year. Now this may not seem like much, but remember, waste management today has over 32,000 trash trucks. Just this one little sleight of hand means that we just made our company $240 million more profitable. If that doesn't pump up the stock price and get you a bonus, I don't know what will. This is the beauty of cooking the books. One simple little change, an 8 to a 10 for their front loader trash trucks, or 10 years to 12 years for their other trucks, and you suddenly show around a quarter of a billion dollars more in profit. And just to clarify, so when you depreciate something, this is like required by the government, right? Required by the IRS. So if you like fudge the numbers or change like the useful life or like how many years you depreciated by, that is illegal, right? It's fraud. Yes. So if you're choosing to alter the depreciation schedule by not following the depreciation rules, then you are committing a form of tax fraud. And so depreciation is taken over the course of the period of time that the government has chosen. But if you start establishing your own periods and your own metrics, you can definitely find yourself in some tax trouble. This is our friend Carlton Dennis, by the way. Yeah, so how's it going, everybody? My name is Carlton Dennis, licensed enrolled agent, and I help everyday entrepreneurs leverage the tax code to the fullest extent. He really helped us understand how waste management cooked the books 
And if you want to save on taxes legally, you should definitely subscribe to his channel with the link below. He's got some of the best tax content on YouTube. And this trick that he helped us explain, this is just the beginning. So don't go anywhere yet, because we're just getting started. Another big expense in the trash business is landfills. Landfills are expensive, and Waste Management owned and operated more than 100 of them at the time. And just like trash trucks, as trash trucks get used, their value goes down, so you have to account for that expense, which drives down your profit. The same goes for landfills. As your landfills get filled with trash, they go down in value, so you too have to record those expenses as your landfills fill up, which again, drives down your profit. Landfill expenses are a very niche thing that not many people will notice. It's as simple as not recording these landfill-related expenses at all. No one will bat an eye. Which again, makes you look more profitable on paper than you really are. And then there were the so-called sweeps. So far, we've only cooked the books to reduce our expenses, how much money we're spending on paper. But there's another lever we can tweak, revenue, how much money we're making on paper. And to make us look like we're making more money on paper, we're going to do something called a sweep. At the end of every quarter, take a sweep of all the stuff your company has. Look for cash that has been set aside for reserves. Reserves are cash that has been set aside for things like emergencies, accidents, payroll for workers money needed to keep the day-to-day -day operations going. And then it's simple. Instead of leaving that money marked as reserves, just arbitrarily mark it as income and call it a day, thereby making it look like the company was bringing in more money than it really was. And these are only a few of the things Waste Management's executive team did to cook the books. There were many other tactics, but they all revolved around this same concept move a few numbers around here and there to show that the company is doing better than it is, thus pumping the stock price, thus pumping your wallet. However, if all you did was cook the books, you would be immediately screwed. Because unfortunately for you, public companies get audited, meaning that it's required by law that an independent accounting company looks at your books to make sure there aren't any discrepancies like these. That is a problem. Accountants are trained to look for inaccuracies like these, so we gotta find a way around this. And in this case, it was an accounting firm called Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson was one of the biggest accounting companies in the world, and they specialized in auditing so it didn't take them long to know that something wasn't adding up. But even when they came to you accusing you of fraud, you were sure of one thing. Everyone has a price. All you had to do was find theirs. Once you did, it was as easy as wiring Arthur Anderson additional fees to look the other way. And just like that, you had the one organization that was supposed to keep you in check eating out of your pocket. Waste management was now knee-deep in white-collar crime. And the problem with cooking your books is that it becomes a vicious cycle. Every year you would have to beat last year's inflated numbers, unless you wanted the stock price to go down. And the only way to do that was to cook the books even more. So every year you would have to fake reports based on the fake reports of last year. It was fraud on top of fraud on top of even more fraud. But you didn't care. As long as you kept cooking the books, waste management stayed a success and the money kept flowing in. In early 1992, the stock was at about $17. Six years later, it was at a staggering $55. Quite a phenomenal rise for a company that collects trash. In those six years, you didn't come up with any cool inventions, you didn't make any big improvements on your services, and many people were actually complaining about your incompetence. Like when the garbage men simply drove by people's houses without collecting the trash or leaving half of it in the driveway. But all of this negativity never showed in the stock price. And it was only a matter of time before people started noticing these inconsistencies. By 
1996, Dean Buntrock, the CEO that orchestrated this scheme, had chosen to retire at age 65. Over the last 40 years, he had taken waste management from a tiny $1 million company to an insane $9 billion behemoth becoming the biggest waste services company in North America. And now it was time to enjoy his wealth and legacy in peace. But trouble was on the horizon. Waste management's new CEO arrived on the scene to replace him, and right from the start, the new CEO knew something wasn't quite right with the company's financial reports. So he ordered a review of the company's accounting books. What he found exceeded even his wildest suspicions. In just six years, Dean and his executives had cooked the books by a staggering $1.7 billion. That's $1.7 billion more profit than they actually made. It was the biggest financial restatement in corporate history. When the news broke, the stock price immediately crashed, taking $6 billion with it from everyone that was invested in the company. We're talking mutual funds, pension funds, individual investors, and retirement accounts of average everyday people. But Dean and the other waste management executives didn't care. Dean had already cashed in big time. He pocketed more than $16.9 million in bonuses over the years, all thanks to the incredible performance of his company. These millions came in the form of performance bonuses and stock options. They got to hang on to their high-paying prestigious jobs. They got retirement bonuses, lucrative employment contracts. They dumped their shares onto the public while the fraud was ongoing. And the best part? In the years leading up to the scandal, Dean knew they would eventually get caught. So right before the news broke, he sold $4.5 million worth of company stocks and donated a bunch of waste management stock to the college he went to to fund a building in his name right before the stock price crashed. Pretty genius if you ask me. In the end, the SEC ordered Dean to pay almost $20 million in fines and his executives got fined according to how much money they made off with. And Arthur Anderson? They had to pay $7 million for covering up the fraud. Arthur Anderson was also the auditors behind the Enron and WorldCom collapses, which put them out of business. And Dean's executives? Four of them ended up settling the case with the SEC for $30.8 million. It's done? Oh, good. Hey. All right, that's it. It's over. You can all go. The company's gone. What's sad about all of this is that it was for just a measly $17 million. And then he had to pay a $20 million fine. When in reality, if Dean had just not taken the company public, if he didn't have this grow at all cost mentality, if he just kept more ownership of waste management and ran the company leaner and more efficiently, he probably would have made more than $17 million in legitimate money. Because after all, people will always need their trash picked up. And unless you do a horrible job at it, customers aren't likely to ever switch trash collectors. He wouldn't have had to deal with all the headaches of being a public company. He wouldn't have had to deal with a board of directors, pressure from analysts. And most importantly, he would have kept more of the money for himself. But instead, he became the center of, quote, one of the most egregious accounting frauds, the SEC has ever seen." End quote. Waste management's executives did a fantastic job at hiding their fraudulent schemes for almost six years. But they weren't the only company hiding a dark secret. It turned out that Victoria's Secret was also hiding a dark secret. The owner of the lingerie brand, Les Wexner, happened to be best friends with everyone's favorite private island owner, Efri Jepstein. The owner of a company that employs underaged girls to model in lingerie being best friends with Effie Jepstein? What could go wrong? As it turns out, Les Wexner, who could be a tyrant of a boss, gave Epstein unprecedented access to his empire. At some point, Epstein even boasted he was the personnel director for Victoria's Secret, which was probably the perfect excuse to recruit more underaged girls for his secret operation. But talking about all the details of Epstein's connection to Victoria's Secret would definitely get any public video demonetized on YouTube, which is why we've released a private documentary available only to members of this channel. And so far, 
people have been loving the documentary. All you have to do to get access to the video on the Epstein Victoria Secret Connection is to click the join button below. Once you sign up, you'll get exclusive access to documentaries on CIA black sites, MKUltra, the Bin Laden Papers, and many more. These are the things they should be teaching you in university about how the world works. But unlike university, you get all of this for just $5 a month. And there's a refund policy too, unlike most YouTube memberships. So if you join and you don't think it's worth it, email us within your first month of joining and we will personally refund you for your first month. After your first month, there is no refund. So scroll down and hit that join button now. What's up guys, we're sharing a mic right now. This is my friend Carlton and he really helped me understand all this stuff for this video. So really big shout out to him. And Carlton, you wanna introduce yourself? Hey guys, my name is Carlton Dennis. I'm a licensed enrolled agent and I'm a tax strategist. So I help out business owners reduce their overall tax bill. If you have any questions in regards to taxes, feel free to hit the subscribe link on my channel. So yeah, Carlton makes some of the best tax content on YouTube. So if you are a business owner or self-employed or whatever, and you wanna reduce your taxes legally, definitely check out his channel with the link below. It's super informative. But yeah, if you guys are new here, this is one of the biggest channels on YouTube for documentaries on money, power, war, and crime, just like this video. So if you enjoyed this one, click the subscribe button below. You can follow me on Instagram at Jake Chen. You can follow Carlton at Carlton Dennis, I believe. But yeah, that's going to wrap it up. Thanks for watching. Stay dangerous out there, and we will see you guys in the next one.